Well, standing by, all participants will be in listen-only mode until the question-answer session of today's conference. At them, you may ask a question by pressing star 1. Conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd like to turn the meeting over to Irene Ihear. Thank you. You may begin. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. Irene Ihear of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. On July 14, 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued the draft guidance Prince for Co-Development of an in vitro companion diagnostic device with therapeutic product. This draft guidance is intended to assist with the co-development of a therapeutic product and an accompanying IVD companion diagnostic. Guidance is also intended to assist FDA staff with reviewing companion diagnostics for their associated therapeutic products. The focus of today's webinar is to share information and answer questions about the draft guidance document. Your presenters will be Christopher Leptak from the Office of New Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, and Pamela Bradley from the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health in CDRH. Following the presentation, we will open the line for your questions related to topics in this draft guidance only. Additionally, there are other center subject matter experts available to assist with the Q&A portion of this webinar. I give you Chris. Hello, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to today's webinar, and, and I wish to extend sincere apologies for the, the technical difficulties and certainly appreciate your patience um, uh, for holding on, on the line for the last 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, unfortunately, as with most things, uh, with computers, uh, the, the problems arise when you least expect them. So again, we appreciate your patience. Uh, as was said, we're going to uh, start this presentation with a, a more formal discussion of what is in the guidance, uh, and that will be followed by a Q&A. So I'll be kicking us off uh, for the first couple of slides, and then Pam will be finishing the presentation. We would much appreciate it if you could please hold your questions until the Q&A session, um, and that will be an opportunity to have a more general discussion. Uh, so just to begin, the um, uh, co-development guidance uh, uh, was a center effort here at the FDA. Um, between uh, CEDAR, the Center for Drugs, uh, CDRH, the Center for Devices, and also for CBER, uh, the Center for Biologics. Um, there was a working group that convened to draft the guidance, since ultimately the subject uh, cut for the guidance affects all three product centers. Uh, as mentioned, the, uh, the guidance has been published in draft form back uh, last month. Uh, the open comment period is through the middle of October. So the purpose of today's uh, webinar is to orient you to the guidance and also hopefully facilitate your input onto the guidance as part of the, uh, the public comment period. Uh, the webinar is such that given the, the time constraints, um, Pat will try to uh, limit the formal presentation. Initially, it will be 40 minutes. We'll try to, to, to gain some time there. So we'll open up and uh, still retain the, the full 20 minutes for the Q&A as much as possible. Um, with that, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, uh, the the uh, co-development guidance is the second in a series of guidances in the space where both a drug and a diagnostic are being um, uh, brought together as part of a, a development program. Uh, for the purposes of our conversation, um, we'll be referring to drug, which means both drugs and biologics, um, and we say a tester device, which would be in uh, the CDRH realm of the in vitro diagnostic. Uh, the first in this series was the Companion Diagnostics Guidance, um, which was published in uh, final form uh, back in August of 2014, um, uh, which defined ultimately uh, what the definition for Companion Diagnostic was and when it would be appropriate uh, for guidance to be uh, invoked. Although it was more of a, a definitional uh, uh, guidance rather than a process one, uh, in that it defined what a Companion Diagnostic is, which is ultimately a guidance that is essential for the safe and effective use of the corresponding therapeutic product. It uh, described the uses of when companion diagnostics could be invoked, which is ultimately identifying populations most likely to benefit uh, or most at risk for adverse uh, reactions from a therapeutic, the response to adjust for treatment, also to identify the population for whom the drug would be most safe and effective for its use. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, the guidance described the, the regulatory requirements around labeling as such, but it was not a how-to. Uh, that's where the co-development guidance comes into play, that it 
it's more of a how do you do a co-development uh, program where both a drug and a, a test are in play. So next slide. Right, right now we are on slide number six uh, for the folks on the on the call. The the draft guidance um, uh, uh, for co-development ultimately it's a how-to guidance. And in general, the, the, the guidance, as we'll walk through as part of this formal presentation, will cover the various components that are uh, addressed as part of the guidance of this content. So next slide, slide seven. Um, so first off, uh, we're going to just focus on some of the, the general to orient everybody, since this may uh, be a, a, a new concept or topic area for you. And then we'll go through each of the different uh, guidance topics in greater detail. Next slide, eight. So of a co-development program, um, uh, what we've seen at the FDA is that the the role of the diagnostic as part of the drug development program occur at many different points during that, that drug development paradigm. It could be a uh, intended co-development program from the beginning, uh, everything from the, the preclinical development, preclinical development, all the way through the program. Um, but many times, depending on the uh, uh, the analyte that the um, uh, test is assessing on the biomarker, so that biomarker in terms of the product development cycle may not be appreciated until after some exploratory studies, especially in the early phases of that drug development program. As such, co-development is not necessarily intended to be a simultaneous development, but rather that once the co-development paradigm has been identified, that at the time of approval of the drug and the therapeutic, that there would be a co-approval or a contemporaneous approval. Um, such that once the, the, um, the therapeutic product and the drug product are marketed, that both products are available to the, um, uh, the public at the same time, since it's, it's important they uh, be available for healthcare decisions on the part of healthcare providers. Um, I mentioned that the co-development guidance is focused on companion diagnostics. Um, but that said, uh, even if a, a, a diagnostic doesn't meet this essential uh, definition to be called a companion diagnostic, the principles of development would apply even in, in scenarios where that essential threshold has not been met. So it's very much important that as part of a, a therapeutic program, that if a device is in play, that you sort of plan it ahead and plan in advance if you're not sure of what the role of that biomarker or diagnostic is going to ultimately be. Slide, slide nine. Let's talk a little, little bit about some of the co-development clinical trials at a very high level. Uh, so on slide number 10, um, when you're doing a co-development program, um, not only are you developing the drug and the device, but many times the data, the support of both the and the device are occurring from data that is uh, gathered as part of a, a single clinical trial design. Um, many, sometimes there's aspects of the, the therapeutic program or for the, the, the program that necessitates sort of separate studies that are focused on only one of the two products. The the um, uh, the data that is collected can be supportive of both uh, the the drug and the device uh, sort of in tandem. Um, the considerations as part of the clinical trial line are, are 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 fairly complex, and it's also dependent upon the the disease and the methods of action, et cetera. I don't really know one size fits all, but some of the things that the uh, product developers would like to consider are the mechanistic rationale for selecting the marker that's in play. Um, the nature of the disease and whether or not there are other uh, therapeutics that are available, um, not you're moving people away from standard of care, uh, level of characterization in the test negative population, and also some prospective or retrospective analyses. Uh, slide number 11, please. Ultimately, um, the talks about the process by which a drug and uh, diagnostic are, are co-developed. Um, not a, a portion of how to design your clinical trial in any great de detail. Uh, certainly, there are many different trial designs that are feasible. Two are listed here. Um, and honestly, there's an, another guidance in this space uh, called the Enrichment Strategies Guidance that I'll talk about in a moment, um, where these different trial designs are discussed in much greater detail. Um, ultimately, when it comes to which trial design best fits, uh, your particular program is, is in large part depending upon the, the knowledge of the pathogenesis of the disease, the strength of evidence for the biomarker, the biologic plausibility, and ultimately what the results of that biomarker are, are leading to, whether it's uh, identifying the patient population of interest, adjusting, adjusting dose, uh, move people away from a potential adverse outcome, et cetera. Um, so these are just two examples 
of, of what uh, a program may look like that's incorporating both um, a therapy and a device product. Next, next slide. Number 12. Uh, so the enrichment strategies guidance uh, is a draft guidance that's in the process of going to final. It was published as draft back in 2012. And we should list the, um, uh, the references here for uh, uh, your um, uh, perusal. Um, the purposes of today's seminar is not to discuss the enrichment uh, uh, trial guidance in detail, um, but certainly there is content there that is very much um, uh, supportive of what's covered in the co-development guidance. Uh, slide 13. Uh, retrospective, uh, uh, pro sorry, prospective retrospective approaches. Um, uh, as part of a development paradigm, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the role of the, the, the biker may not be fully understood, especially in early phase development. As such, uh, it's um, uh, uh, beneficial if the drug developers at that time um, uh, end up storing samples or tissue that ultimately later could be studied as that role that marker is, is further elucidated. And as such, if you have this, the, the stored material, you could then prospectively design a study to look at that collected information and see what information might be gathered from that, both for the drug and the device, as that product uh, co-development continues forward. Uh, slide 14. So trying to identify your patient populations, ultimately to ensure to the best extent and uh, that is uh, feasible that you have an adequate representation of the biomarkers within that patient population as part of that drug development program. Um, then the mechanism of action of the drug and the streak of evidence for the biomarker, as we talked about in some of the clinical trial designs, uh, you may end up focusing on only on marker positive patients uh, to a large degree, um, or it may be more prudent to actually look at, at all marker status as part of the trial. Um, and again, it's very much context specific. Um, if you're going to differentiate based on marker status, seeing what the cutoff values are between the uh, marker positive and marker negative are going to be essential for the interpretation of the clinical trial results, especially from the device perspective. Uh, next slide, slide 15. And I'm going to turn it over to Pam, who's going to be discussing the aspects of the co-development guidance that are more in the uh, device space. Great. Thank you, Chris. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, someone will let me know if you can't. <laughs> Okay, so thanks everyone for tuning in today, and now we'll move on to requirements for investigational products. Okay, in co-development co development programs, it's often the case that you have both a product and an IVD that are investigational, and both of these products have their distinct requirements. So the investigational new drug regulation is at 21 CFR 312, and the investigational device regulation is at 21 CFR 812. These are separate regulations. They're intended to address separate products. And compliance with one regulation doesn't mean that the other regulation is fulfilled. So each regulation needs to be considered in the context of each separate product. Um, and as we've sort of continued down this path towards prison medicine, we're seeing more and more of these therapeutic product trials that use investigational tests. And so we're hoping that this guidance will help to answer the question we're getting frequently. And these questions tend to be about the IVD side of the equation. Much of this section of the draft guidance is focused on IVD issues. First, uh, what do you mean by investigational IVDs? Well, in this context of co-development where a therapeutic product or clinical trial uses um, S, the test would be considered investigational if it was used for a purpose but has not already received FDA marketing authorization for that specific intended use. And we're all on the same page, I'll point out that the term marketing authorization is just an inclusive way of saying that it's been approved, cleared, or granted a de novo request by FDA. Okay, now this investigational test, now what? Well, in the IDE requirements, what apply? Okay. That the regulatory requirements depend on the level of use, level of risk that, uh, that the investigational IVD presents to the study subject. So investigational tests can be exempt uh, from the IDA regulation. Or if they're not exempt, then they fall into one of two categories, either significant risk or non-significant risk. And this slide provides an overview of, of a very broad overview of risk determination. And the first question is, is the test exempt? And the, the full criteria for exemption is spelled in um, 812.2. But in short, um, and in this context for co-development pro programs, an investigational IVD would be exempt in situations where the testing 
is not used as a diagnostic procedure without confirmation of diagnosis by another medically established diagnostic product or procedure. And also to be in this category of exempt, it would have to be a non-invasive sampling procedure. So for example, um, if a test is used for exploratory purposes or retrospective analyses, using uh, tissue from a routine biopsy, that could be the exempt category. If is not exempt, the next question is, is use, use of the test in the trial pose significant risk to the trial subjects? So it's spelled out fully in 812.3. Um, and the, the most relevant provision of 812.3 is, is for co-development programs is the, the quote, is it for use of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease or otherwise preventing impairment of human health and presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a subject, end quote, since you can't air quotes. <laughs> um, so it comes from using the investigational test for critical medical decisions in these trials, decisions like enrolling subjects, assigning subjects in a trial to different treatment arms, or selecting a particular therapeutic dose for a subject. These, these uses are the ones that could provide, um, may pose serious risks to the safety or welfare of subjects if the test result is incorrect. On the other hand, something like being the marker across treatment arms based on the test result would not be expected to pose significant risk to the study subject. And this is what we call non-significant risk. I'll note that risk termination takes into account many other factors beyond this simple is it used for in the trial. It may look at disease or um, other effects, um, other treatments that are available. And so it, it's not always a forward process. And FDA, in an attempt to um, provide more clarity on this, we'll plow is intending to put out a draft guidance to explain um, further this risk determination um, process, but it's not, not related to very much spent in the co-development guidance. Okay, so, so if the investigational test is the risk, the sponsor has to comply with the IDE requirements, again, spelled out in 812 and in guidance, but um, this is having to submit to the agency an IDE IDE submission, and approval is required before the trial can proceed. On the other hand, if it's not significant risk, the sponsor still has to apply with abbreviated requirements, which include providing the IRB with an explanation for why it's not significant risk, but there's no IDE submission in this case. So, commitment trials, they raise unique issues because often you have an IVD that's important for meeting the objectives of the as it relates to the therapeutic product, but it's also an investigational IVD. So sometimes the information about the IVD is also needed by the therapeutic product center. And we've got a lot of questions over the years about where should the information go, and we've tried to clarify that in this draft guidance. So as I mentioned, if the investigational IVD is significant risk, you need to FDA and ID submission, and that's where the information about the IVD will go. Risk information in an IND is, will not suffice for IDE requirements, so it has to be done in its own IDE. But if the information is also necessary, if the IVD information is necessary to determine for the therapeutic product center to determine whether the trial can meet its stated objectives, it may be sufficiently IND to cross-reference the IDE. Um, and then in the case of non-significant risk, uh, an IDE isn't submitted, so if the Therapeutic Product Center needs the IVD information, then it, may, it will go into the IND, and there will be a discussion about this, um, the Therapeutic Product Center. So that information actually goes into this IDE. And here's some things we think are generally useful for assessing investigational IVDs and co-development programs. Obviously, these would only be included in the IDE if they're relevant for the use of the IVD in the particular trial. So we're looking for a description of the IVD cutoff value, a description of the pre-analytical and analytical studies that demonstrate the, the reliability of the assay, particularly around the cutoff value, and we're looking at the results of these studies as well, uh, a description and the results from other analytical studies that support the conclusion that the use of the IVD doesn't expose the subjects to unreasonable risk of harm. The other studies could be precision or limits 
of detection, specificity, things like that. And um, the clinical trial protocol should be included, and this can be done either through direct submission or by referencing the appropriate IND. If you're referencing an IND, a letter of authorization to cross-reference should be provided by the therapeutic product sponsor, and um, of letter of these letters are are in the appendix. Okay, so to IVD considerations in co-development programs, there are, there are two sections. Two pretty sections about this in the draft guidance. One, first one is essentially about what to do when you're getting started, and the major theme here is plan ahead. And second is about things that happen in later stages of co-development programs and how to deal with some of the issues that get started. Okay. Start by saying hope is obvious, and that is the test is important. <laughs> so if the test isn't reliable or accurate, it could compromise the ability of the trial to create an effect on the treatment. It could also compromise the ability to whether the test can appropriately identify the subjects for whom the therapeutic product is intended to provide benefit. I've seen cases of this where the testing was inconsistent and the drug was not able to be approved. These are situations we'd like to avoid, so we provided recommendations in this draft guidance for how to approach code development programs from an IVD perspective to help avoid some of the common problems that we've seen. Okay, these common problems that we've seen. And, and we've been looking at multiple, many, many uh, co-development programs over the past 15 plus years and, um, and some of the problems. So the test not adequately validated prior to use in the trial such that, you know, the test performance is not robust enough for the needs of the therapeutic product sponsor. It's a problem when multiple tests with different performance are used in the trials. Is it really hard to know how the tests are comparing and whether they would identify the same population? It's usually a problem when changing to the test during trials. And here, it's, it's hard to know if the change test would identify the same population as the test before it was changed. And the possibility of um, introducing bias from pre screening. So, pre screening is what we refer to the practice of using local tests to funnel patients into marker-based clinical trials. One problem is that there's no, no assurance that local tests are interchangeable or standardized. And the problem is that pre-screening could result in an advanced clinical trial population that doesn't actually represent the population that would re be selected in real-world testing. Okay, problems. And uh, are there some questions? Please stay by for today's conference. Pam will be rejoining us momentarily. Please continue standing by. Hello, operator.
This is the opera. We appreciate your patience. We're just experiencing some technical difficulties. Please hold on the line. Pam will be joining us momentarily. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. I hope you can hear me now. I think uh, we were just getting to some solutions, so <laughs> that's the important part, not the problem. Okay, so one theme here is that the test, let's see, if, okay, everyone can hear me. Great. Um, over the test should be analytically validated and it should be locked down before using it in a clinical trial. It should change during the course of the trial. It should be efficiently analytically robust particularly around that clinical decision point or the cutoff. And using a test in a trial that's intended to provide the clinical validation, it's really important to have completed the analytical validation studies that are evaluating those critical performance parameters. And in pivotal trials, you should really be using a test with market-ready performance. And in guidance, we define market-ready as um, a test that's completely specified with complete analytical validation and one that they're product sponsored expectations for performance. So, let's make sure. Not able to, let's see. Oh. So, we're listing some, some additional general recommendations for who, helping to reduce um, variability in test performance. So, all clinical trial assays or CAs should be fully specified, including all the components, all the protocols, all the instrumentation. It's important to implement a single testing protocol at all sites that are involved in the trial. Also, the, um, the sensor should evaluate the ability of test results among the potential sites prior to initiating testing at those sites. And the pre clinical reagents and instrumentation should be considered to be part of the test system, and these should be validated along with the IVD. So, for example, tools or reagents for DNA extraction should be, should be part of that test, and they should be validated as such. Also, um, for all the steps of the pre-analytical specimen handling and preparation, there should be detailed SOPs or protocols that are followed at each of the sites that perform any of these steps so that everybody getting you the, the specimen um, and the analyte in, this, in the way that you, you need it. So it's very comparable. Okay. Next slide is listing recommendations for how to address that pre-screening bias, which, as I mentioned, it can happen when local screening is effectively be screened for identifying patients eligible for, eligible for clinical trials, where they're only sending forward those patients who are eligible according to a local test, maybe missing patients who would be negative according to that local test, but are, are, might be positive according to the test used in the trial. So recommendations, one, avoid enrolling subjects in trial based on confirmation of local test results, if you can. Two, Ask the participating clinical sites to send forward specimens from all potential enrollees, not just the ones that were positive by their tests. And three, when it's unavailable, which is, is the case in, in certain situations, and particularly in oncology, it's important to be aware of the potential for bias and evaluate whether the expected prevalence of the marker is being skewed by pre-screening, and then to develop approaches to address this uh, select bias. Guidance also makes the point that it's important to know what analytical studies are likely to be necessary to support IVD pre-market submission and to plan ahead for those studies. Again, plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. So, for an analyte is potentially unstable, it, it's necessary to take several samples. It can be from a small number of clinical trial subjects, but um, that helps you assess the stability. Um, in general, Sponsors collect and, and bank adequate samples from the clinical trials to be able to complete this full range of analytical studies that are, they anticipate having to do. But it should be that not all analytical validation studies need to be done with the clinical trial specimens. But to do these, you know, with non-clinical trial specimens, it's important that the samples are from the target population so we can reduce the chance variability. And I'll note that some validation studies uh, it's possible to do them with contrived samples, and it, this is in cases when it's 
not possible to obtain the specimens with a particular marker or something like that. Okay. Um, banking, bank specimens is, is really critical to being able to fully validate this IVD. And so of the therapeutic trial, and Chris mentioned this in the beginning, if you believe there's a need for a diagnostic or there may be a need, then you should have a plan in place for banking those samples for feed studies. Appendix 2 in the draft guidance goes into a lot of detail about specimen handling. This also includes a lot of information about banking specimens. So here in this slide are just some of the highlights from the appendix. In time, I'll kind of run through these pretty quickly. Um, bank the samples from the pen to diagnose population, not just the subjects here enrolled. Make sure to consider accessibility to samples in foreign countries. It's also important to consider the informed consent policies for all uses of samples. For example, making sure that retesting is, is covered. Thorough specimen annotation is needed, and it's important to consider how stable the analyte is when you're storing those specimens, because you may be better off storing a purified or extracted analyte. Okay, so another component that's really critical to successful diagnostic development is that's this issue of training versus validation sets. Okay, so the set of clinical samples used to design the IVD and establish that clinical decision point or cutoff is referred to as the training set. So testing should be conducted with a second set of independent clinical samples to validate that the chosen cutoff is the right one. This set is called the validation set. So diagnostics, the validation set is generally made up of samples from the subjects who were screened for enrollment in your efficacy trial. For this reason, you really want to have your IVD design and assay cutoffs established before IVD is applied to these samples. Sometimes after seeing the data, the sponsor will want to change the cutoff. So, for example, they may want to change it to include all of the responders. So they're made based on the results from the validation set, and effectively this becomes a new training set for FID VD, and then the new cutoff should be validated with a different independent set of clinical samples. So, and we know that other type changes might happen as well. So they could be changes in reagent configurations or instruments or platforms and also happen pretty late in the IVD development or in the co-development program. And so in these cases to determine whether this new test has a very similar performance to the previous test, we might need to do what's called or typically will need to do what's called a bridging study. So a bridging study is a statistical plan to assess concordance and discordance between two tests using the same samples from um, the clinical trial. So uh, appropriate takes into account discordance, missing samples, and effect on drug efficacy. The retest population really should be representative of the intended use population for the IVD, and it should uh, adequately reflect the characteristics that could affect the test performance, because the analysis of the trial is potentially biased if this retest population isn't representative. So there would be a plan to analyze the worst case scenario for missing data um, with a sensitivity analysis. Okay, general advice. And maybe wondering how to implement this advice in your specific code development plan, because there's always going to be specific considerations that feed into the plan. So our advice is basically as soon as you know that there's code development intent, use the pre-submission program for feedback about specific IVD issues. The sub is a formal written requests from the sponsor to FDA requesting FDA feedback. And it's an opportunity to ask questions and have discussions with the review teams about the product development. Quite to clinical protocols or analytical studies or the appropriate regulatory pathway for the IVD. The draft guidance provides some links and additional information about the pre-sub program. And again, please use this process to catch us as early as possible. The goal is really for IV, IVD development to be efficient as possible and not to slow down the development of the therapeutic product, which is usually further along at the point where the IVD gets involved. Okay, switching gears to go over the recommendations for coordinating the review of the IVD and the therapeutic product. Again, the goal of this contemporaneous approval. So here are the different submission types. You have the new drug application for the drugs, the DA, the biologics license application for the biologics, and companion diagnostic will likely be class three and require a 
um, a permission, but we do have information on there about um, other potential pathways. The statutory time differ for the therapeutic products and the IVDs, but in practice, the IVD review is going to be kept on track with the therapeutic product review timeline so that those products can men come into the market at the same time. And in cases, those therapeutic product timelines are shortened um, further, such as for expedited review or accelerated approval, and that can create a real crunch on the IVD side of things. But the things that we do and that the sponsors can do to help out um, in those cases, one is IVD priority review. So generally, FDA is granted priority review status to the diagnostic submissions, and this is particularly true when when a diagnostic is the, is the first of a kind. Um, another thing that helps is the regular PMA process, where so the modules are submitted as they're completed and not waiting until all the clinical data is there to submit everything as a complete package. So this, this process basically gives a start in reviewing the IVD, and this allows any issues that are found along the way to be identified and addressed. Um, that module that comes in is the clinical data and that's basically timed with the um, of the review of the drug as well. Okay, so uh, with respect to the manufacturing inspection, FDA has to schedule this as early as possible for companion diagnostics, so they have time to address any findings from those inspections um, before uh, that before the lines. It's helpful for FDA to have this module as early as possible. So the necessary documentation can be in place in the, ahead of the, the inspection. There's also the BIMO, or research monitoring inspections, and these are the inspections of the clinical investigations. It's really helpful for us, for the FDA, if, if the BIMO information is organized in the PMA, either in its own section or somehow identified as BIMO information. The types of BIMO information are detailed in the, in the guidance. It may also be necessary to set up a master file. For example, uh, maybe the therapeutic product company has proprietary information, but this information is relevant to the IVD view. So IVD application, it can reference this master file to get, to get information. So if you think this is going to be the case, it's good to set those up. Uh, likewise, it's good to set up these letters of authorization ahead of time or um, as the products come in um, so, that, so that each one refer to the other. So um, it's basically the other applicant to refer to the NDA or the BLA or the PMA in support of the other applicant's product. And those, there's some letters, for example, providing the appendix. So moving on to labeling. Okay, so the draft guidance, it reiterates the point that was made in the companion diagnostic finance, as mentioned in the beginning, and then that is that um, the two labels need to be consistent with each other. So as an example, if the dedicated for a population that has a particular spectrum of gene variants, diagnostic should be indicated for the detection of all those variants in that spectrum. This also discusses that there are several types of claims that could be generated for a companion diagnostic. And, um, that the claims, these claims are usually based on how the IVD was used in the major efficacy trial. First, prediction claims. Prediction claim would be supported by evidence that the benefit accrues to, only primarily to, a population that's divine, defined by that IVD result, or um, that serious adverse reactions are confined to that population defined by the IVD result. So claims, they require information about both test positive and test negative. It's, and so it's not possible to support a prediction aim for the IVD if you only tested the test positive, or sorry, if only um, in the test positive or the test negative. In these cases, you just don't have information about the safety and efficacy of the population that's not treated. So trial designs like that, where only the test positive subjects or only the test negative subjects are selected for enrollment in a trial, they really support companion diagnostic claims for patient selection. Um, and the final category of monitoring claims, the government really doesn't go into the trial designs needed to support this, so you should discuss the types of claims with the agency directly. 
The so final topic before we open it up for Q&A um, is post-marketing considerations, and this is short and sweet. Uh, first thing I want to make is that we recommend that sponsors, therapeutic product sponsors, consult with FDA when they're designing their post-marketing studies. That might involve companion diagnostics. And the next point is, is pretty straightforward, Holly. Um, if for adverse uh, uh, reporting, so report reportable events to the IVD center, therapeutic product reportable events to the therapeutic product center, not clear, or if both products could have contributed to the reportable event, report to both centers. Okay, so let's sum up here with some key points. Um, use a clinical trial strategy that provides evidence for both the therapeutic product and IVD. Research and guidance, because it goes into much more depth on um, the trials that are appropriate for these studies. In FDA early and often, IVD sponsors can use a pre-sub program at any time in the process, plan ahead, collect clinical trial specimens, annotate and store them well because they will be needed for additional analytical validation studies and bridge studies or in the cases of um, when learning about the biomarker at retrospective, um, prospective retrospective studies as well. So the product Sponsors are encouraged to engage with the IVD partner as soon as possible in this process. The sponsor should determine what the IDA requirements are and, and apply to the investigational IVD that they're using in their trial and fill them. Um, it's really important to complete analytical validation studies before using the test in the trial. It's recommended to use test with market performance in the pivotal trials. Okay, so I'll end with this comp slide. So even the simplified view of code development, it's really a complex to figure. And I think that's the nature of this code development process because you're trying to we do distinct processes into one and get across the same finish line. So for these, you need to think about whether you need an IDE submission, completing your analytical studies before using the test in the trial. You need to validate and you know the test and lock it down again before continuing in. So it's these that are going in and out of this analytical validation studies. And they need a bridging study if you are, if the final version that you're putting before the FDA is not the same as it was used in the study. So then the pre-submission process at any point along this continuum to engage agency. On the therapeutic product side, it's much more linear, at least as compared to um, so there are more regular meetings between FDA and the sponsor at the different phases, and they're a great time to discuss um, incorporating a companion diagnostic strategy into the therapeutic product development. Okay, so with that, I will remind you that the docket's open until mid-October. We hope that you'll submit comments and help us analyze this draft. I want to point out that although we did a pretty deep, uh, comprehensive walkthrough today, that that draft guidance contains a lot of other points that we haven't raised that are also important for successful code development. And so um, I encourage you to take a deep dive and give us your comments on all aspects of the draft guidance that are important to you. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Um, we'll now turn it over to the Q&A. And I, um, we have colleagues from, the, uh, from all three centers that have been involved in this. Other people were involved as well. It was a, um, a great effort. Um, I think we can end it up for questions now. Thank you. Good question. At this time, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and clearly record your name at the prompt. To ask your question, please press star 2. Once again, at this time, please press star 1 to ask a question. One moment, please, for the first question. coming through. One moment, please. Good rims. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I didn't hear anything about uh, absolute measurements. You talked about pre-specified cutoffs. 
but are those cutoff values equal to any uh, absolute measurement, or is there any simulation for comparison of a pre-specified cutoff universal standard? I'll let you take that one. Sorry, this one. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. So, in terms of the cuff, you want to know how that corresponds with the. Uh, I'm sorry, is you still there? Still so here. Um, the realize the line is open. My, uh, what I mean by a, a standard that is a cuff could be a one or a plus two, whereas a standard is a micrograms per mil or nanograms per picogram or microgram total protein, standard that could be reproduced by other sources or orthogonal methods as opposed to a, a uh, internally agreed upon entry cutoff. Yeah, so, um, we uh, would accept a uh, cutoff like plus one or plus two if it was adequate explain how you got to that score. Um, as you probably know, there are multiple ways to to get to a certain score. We would also accept a cut that was um, a quantitative measurement or even a qualitative measurement of positive or negative if you have some kind of internal standard for understanding what a positive and negative was. Does that answer your question? So the um, rough standard to which these are required, that is, I'm uh, concerned then that essentially a, a, a could be analytically validated uh, for producibility, not for uh, so precision, but not for accuracy. Um, so we would look for um, validation of accuracy as well as precision or cutoff that, that you establish. It infers that you, you can obtain the same result by an orthogonal method. So for us, accuracy would be, um, in most cases, comparison to uh, a truth, a reference method, a clinical manifestation. But we've done a number of these now, and this has, has not been an issue in general. The accuracy also pans out clinically by assessing whether the patients you selected actually got the benefit um, intended. And the accuracy analytically is generally demonstrated against samples with a known value, whether that's a qualitative or a quantitative value or semi quantitative. Question? Mark, your line is open. Hi, thanks very much for taking the question. Um, I'm not entirely certain that I understand some of the elements of timing and what appears to be a, a an involvement of the question regarding the uh, use of a clinical trial assay. Um, you'd be saying that the PMA, most of the time it will be a PMA filing, or a companion diagnostic will have to be completed but not approved prior to commencement of the pivotal study for the therapeutic article. I think I've got that right. I'm trying to sort of square that with the idea of a clinical trial assay, and I, I'm not aware of any stipulation that a CTA cannot be used during the clinical trial. Uh, I, I don't know if the vision study is how you take the CTA, you know, out to approval, but uh, can you elucidate a little bit about the question of, you know, having the entire PMA filed versus having the PMA approved before the commencement of the pivotal study, and assuming that's the case, where the clinical trial assay fits into all this? Sure. This is Pam. I'll take a first crack and then turn it over to the room. So, I, yeah, I misspoke, but the, the you have to have a PMA filed before you start the pivotal study. You. you we hope is that the test that's used in the pivotal study has market ready characteristics so that you really understand how that test performs. And, and you, you mentioned that going from the CTA to the IVD that would 
um, be filed as a PMA. That process can, can be done using the bridging study to get from that CTA to the IVD. Does this answer your question? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Our question? Thank you. Before we take the next question, as a reminder, questions are only taken over the phones today. If you'll please press star 1 to ask a question at this time. Our next question is from Abdel Halim. Your line is open. Sure, thank you. Actually, I have, I have four questions. Do I, do I share all of them at once or one by one? I will try them. All right. So uh, for, for, for uh, uh, my question on slide number 4 and slide number 14, I believe the, question, the two points are related. It was meant that uh, you can enroll marker positive subjects only if the biomarker is known to be predictive or prognostic. So does this mean that the biomarker clinical qualification has to be done in a prior clinical trial where the clinical value of the biomarker can be elucidated and the cutoff can be established? This is Mike Paknowski. The that a clinical trial can be conducted in a marker positive subset of patients depends on a number of factors. There may be experimental evidence that would suggest only a certain subset of patients respond. Uh, there may be preliminary evidence from early phase clinical trials that suggest differential responses based on biomarker status. Um, so there's a number of different approaches to, uh, to whether or not a marker positive trial should be conducted. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily rely only upon uh, clinical evidence, necessarily. Mr. Chair, you had mentioned as part of your question qualification. Um, so qualification has a very distinct meaning here at the FDA. Uh, and it involves biomarkers that are developed in a, a drug-independent context, the formal biomarker qualification program. Um, and just, just uh, I'm not sure how you're using that term as part of the question, uh, but just to make that, that clear. I meant, I meant to, to, uh, to prove that you, the biomarker is predictive or prognostic. The, the biomarker development can occur within the IND context or, or through qualification. It wouldn't have to be qualified in a formal sense for used in an in a IND setting and clinical trial. So my 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 next uh, high priority question is about the bridging uh, bridging study. Um, uh, so it, uh, there was not too much details, but my question is: I know it's, it's, it can be case by case uh, from FDA perspective, but in, as Paul Park figure, um, when you do when we do bridging a study with CTA against the to be marketed uh, IVD against the CTA, do we reanalyze uh, samples with the CTA also at the time of bridging, or we consider the uh, initial data? And if we need to reanalyze, because prob probably the samples have been aged, and we, stability can be an issue, uh, wh what about if, uh, if reanalysis with CTA results can be discordant from the initial results? Uh, Paul, Paul, I was answer this one. The question was, when you need to do the bridging study between... No, the question was, if we, uh, in, in your slide number um, number 30, you mentioned the bridging study. I'm assuming you meant bridging of CTA a clinical trial, I say, with, to be marketed IVD. And it happens most of the time now in pharmaceutical industry. So I'm asking, time of bridging, the test do we need to analyze the samples with the CTA or we use initial results from the CTA? Uh, because reanalysis sometimes is needed if instability of the biomarker can be an issue. So the question is, do we need to analyze? And if we reanalyze and the results from reanalysis can be discrepant from initial results, which is of samples we use? I think I understand your question is, do you need to rerun the CTA and the bridging with, when you're doing the bridging? Yeah. Um, I, 
think it would generally be helpful if you if, if you did, didn't have the samples or whatever. We can probably work with the original results. You have to do actual actually uh, uh, reanalysis because of the instability, especially if the study can take two or more years. So I'm asking again my second part of question. If we analyze and found the reanalysis data is not uh, concordant with the initial results, which set of the CTA results will use? Well, I suspect that would be an internal discussion um, with the FDA, and I, yeah, I think you probably want to use the results from when samples of stable. But when, when there's a stability issue, we have a way to uh, field bridging studies that don't necessarily use all of the original clinical samples. So we feel that depending on when the co-development paradigm begins, if it's in the early phase, we expect much like in the clinical program, there's a, a maturation as, as you gather information and there, there's, there's more scientific understanding. The same is true on the device side. Um, certainly we, you know, uh, as the program moves forward, if it's successful and goes into uh, uh, phase three trials. Uh, ultimately, what we would like at the time of the phase three development is that the performance characteristics for the device are set and are, as Pam described, sort of market ready. How to get there, I think, is, is, is a, a bit of a, a, there's a flexibility uh, as the assay evolves and, and if there's issues with, with stored samples. All right, my question was uh, for using, uh, I'm, I'm asking about the clinical trial, pivotal clinical trial with where CT, T, CTA as lab developed tests have been used. Right. So, and more questions, but uh, we have uh, three folks that are, are waiting to answer their questions. So if you don't mind, we'll move on to them. And just so folks, we, we originally scheduled to stop at two, but we're uh, extending it given the technical difficulty earlier, so we do have a hard stop at 2.30. Sure. So the next questioner. Thomas, your line is open. Two questions. Um, do you think you could expand a little bit about situations when you have a device that's considered non-significant risk and information needs to be submitted to the IND instead of an IDE? Um, that's where it seems to be unclear within um, our company about what level of information is really necessary. Often we've submitted and we don't receive a response, so we're not entirely sure uh, um, what the is looking for there. That's the first question, and then I could add a second. That, that one's hard to discuss in a very in a general sense. Um, certainly, if the device is initially considered to be a non-significant risk device, there are are circumstances where the the drug division would still need to know certain aspects about the device's performance in order to be able to interpret the trial from from a perspective. Um, what those characteristics are. And uh, when it would be required is, is very much context and, and case specific. Uh, that information, at least the way we worked it out between the two product centers, is that that device information could then come in under the IND um, at the re request of the, the drug division, and then we can consult with our device colleagues on where the, the information is that, that was, was uh, uh, submitted. So, and the answer correctly, it's really on only if the drug and request that information. So say a, a determination request was put in and comes back NSR, it's then usually generally acceptable then for the sponsor just to submit the protocol as per a typical, not including the device, uh, not including the device and just go forward. Yeah, it's hard because an, an initial classification for the device may be non-significant risk as that program develop matures. Something change that classification to a significant risk or potentially. So the important thing is to make sure that you capture all the information so that if you do require it for the IDE in the future, you have it available. But in the in the interim, so that the request of the directive into the IND is probably the best approach. But if the IND is requested, you're not required to send it. It's only Correct. when the drug division requests that you put something in the IND that you need to do it. Doing it voluntarily ahead of time and weren't in terms of just having a few pages describing the general context of use to actually having like full validation. So, right. okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. And my second question is 
I know I know the the guy you know promulgates using the Markey test in the phase three. Um, some in some cases a test may be implemented in a phase three trial, and then there are some improvements. Is is the agency more open now to allowing concordance between two versions of the test if samples are banked and should have concordance if they make some changes between the test employed in the phase three trial and either it either done all retrospectively in terms of um, basically between the two or having one portion run with one version of the test and the second run with the second version. So I'll start with Fine. We don't necessarily mean market-ready tests, circuit-ready performance characteristics. We understand that there are changes that happen after the trial is done to go to market, and so maybe okay. reagent configurations or things. So, so you don't have to have the test, the exact that comes before the agencies, and that's – so when we market-ready, I just want to find that that doesn't mean market-ready test packaged up, ready to go out. Um, okay. Then for the second part of your question, um, it's it's that in study. So if you do make changes, then it's important to just to changes have affected the performance. Okay. In the sense of concordance and discordance, you're still very similar in that performance. Okay. And, they, and if you think about the post-marketing setting, we, we realize technology changes and nothing is static. There's reasons for the drug label that we, we refer to the device as a CD uh, approved or cleared tests. We don't list a specific test or model, uh, so that that way there is this opportunity for innovation and improvement in the future. Okay. Well, thank yeah, thank you very much. Both of these answers are really help, helpful. Um, if well, no, I know there's another speaker. If it, also, if you had any information to clarify about the differences between complementary and companion diagnostics, it's common or it's a relatively new. Classification. I appreciate hearing anything you guys have to offer on that. Um, I don't want to take the rest of the time as well. So th thank you. I think in the interest of time, uh, since that's a little bit off topic, let's move on to the next questionnaire, please. And I'm George Plopper. Your line is open. Thank you, Rich. Uh, so I have a question with respect to the next generation sequencing-based IVDs. Uh, the recent draft guidance on the use standards for the ingest-based IVDs is restricted only to germline diseases or variants, and I'm wondering uh, for cases where IVD devices are intended as a companion diagnostic for a somatic disease, what kind of guidance can CD or H do with respect to data standards? Lynn, take this one moment we have not published any guidance or draft guidance on that um, we have a public meeting on it where I think a lot of the principles were elucidated at time I would suggest that um, the test developer would talk with OR through the submission process to to get that information okay. and do that okay. yeah thanks uh, for last question, I guess. Question from Julie Engel. Your line is open. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. I just had a question about the uh, use of RUOs in the clinical program. Uh, sounds like there's some flexibility in using those if they are labeled properly, uh, and if they, if you plan to commercialize them, then you would have to under they would have to undergo the design con control process. What about the use of class one assays in this same context? Um, the same Issues of labeling and validation apply, or can they not be used in a clinical program? I don't think there'd be any issue with using a class one device in a, in, in a co-development context. Unfortunately, we haven't identified any cases, or maybe fortunately, we haven't identified any cases in co-development where the device would have been considered class one. Um, the thing were to happen, um, if we had already classified the test, I think we would have to go through the de novo classification process um, and we'll classify it as class one. If we had already classified the test and that intended use as class one, um, 
um, I think we'd have to think about what we would do then in terms of how we would be able to refer to that test and labeling. Um, thank you. I also had a second part of that question. We talk about the, if the possibility of a 510K or a Genovo, and the labeling of that, would that also include the therapeutic in those labels or just the device in the therapeutic label, but not the therapeutic in the device label? intent for a companion diagnostic to mention the therapeutic name in the device label. Is that okay. the device name in the therapy, or, okay. the, or the existence of the device in the therapy? Yeah. Okay, it was, makes sense. It just wasn't clear in the uh, guidance. Thank you. Thank everyone for, for sticking with us, especially with the technical difficulties are on. Hopefully this was helpful to you. And again, just to echo Pam's earlier comments, um, uh, please, if you have any comments, please upload them into the, the public docket, and those comments will be considered as we move the guidance to final in the future. And we're going to meeting back over to Irene I here for closing remarks at this time. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation and transcript will be made available on the CDRH Learn webpage at www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH Learn by Friday, August 26th. Submit draft guidance related comments to docket number FDA 2016 D 1703, October 13, 2016. The doc you found at www.register.gov forward slash A forward slash 2016 If you have additional questions about the draft guidance document, Please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. And this concludes today's webinar. Ending today's presentation, this does conclude the conference. You may disconnect at this time.